and got an agent, and they immediately send you out for commercials. So I started doing commercials, which you know can give you the opportunity to make a living as an actor, which I was able to do. And um, became actually part of history now with one of your commercials. Well, yeah, this, I had this campaign for a soft drink company, Dr. Pepper. I think some people. Have heard of it. Yeah, and it was really one of these things where I I was working as many actors do in a restaurant. And I had this audition. They said, you know, it's a musical audition. Uh, how's your dance? And I, you know, I have checked the box as you do with your agency. Like, dance? Yes. And you always say, yes, I can do that. Skydive? Of course. You know, drive a stick shift? Yeah. Sure, drive, ride a horse, sure. So I went to this uh, dance audition and I realized I was in over my head in New York when dance auditions are oh, called. Wow. I mean, you get the real dancers there, you know. But uh, for one, for whatever reason or other, I was picked and, and was called back. So it started out with like 400 guys, you know, they dressed in you know, jeans and sneakers, and it was whittled down to four of us. Like and, that all-American look. Yeah, this final callback. And I just remember seeing the producer, this woman was giving me one of these, like, what, is this, <laughs> what does this mean? And you know, later that day, after the third callback, uh, over a period of a couple of weeks, I, I was booked to do these three commercials. So you can imagine, it's a 60 second and two 30 second commercials, and it took 22 days to shoot this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked on uh, some independent films, and you can shoot a film in you know 22 days or less. So and, how much Dr. Pepper did you have to drink? Uh, my fair days. share of Dr. <laughs> Pepper, yeah. This was, uh, you know, and, and of course, when you're dancing with them, so they're not cold, oh, and they okay. flatten it, so it doesn't come flying out of the bottle. And so, you're, you know, you're dancing around with, you know. Cold syrup? Well, not cold. We're talking, you know, oh, right, yeah. room temperature, uh, warm, flat Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're a pepper. And I was. So we did these musical spots, started in New York, ended up in San Francisco, and, you know, did these different, uh, Famous locations, you know, New Orleans, we're in the French Quarter, and we have these 10 second little segments of the song to sing and do, and, and uh, they, you know, released them, and they did very well. And uh, you got to see a little bit of the world travel? Got to see, yeah, and, and, you know, after 22 days of, you know, shooting these commercials, we couldn't wait for them to get on the air, because, you know, it was, because we, we thought they were pretty special, and they did, they aired, and they did become pretty darn special. And then the next year, uh, and for the next four years, I was in dancing around. Did you get recognized on the street? Uh, that started to happen, and we were also trying, to, they were trying to figure out different ways, you know, who, who else can be in these commercials with you? So they started doing animation. So we were working with, you know, Bugs Bunny, and, uh, oh, fun. and having, you know, these animated characters. So what you have to do is find out where everyone's looking, and, you know, and basically act interact with something that's not there and and that was you know a challenge but a lot of fun. Mickey Rooney was in one of them and the funny story with him was his agent said first of all they turned us down going no he's not interested. Then they said well yeah okay you can do it but you only have him for three hours so you have to have everything ready to go so that when he comes so we're shooting in New York in a little theater and Mickey Rooney shows up and we're all like wow it's Mickey Rooney. And you know the three hours came and went. We couldn't get rid of this guy. <laughs> he had so much fun, and he just wanted to continue to dance and sing. And what an honor! Yeah, he was a lot of fun. So speaking of dancing and singing, you went on to do a TV show that you also did the theme song for, correct? Uh, you tell me. Uh, can we play? Uh, that sounds like a cue. It sounds like a cue for my sound guy back there. <laughs> if you guys are interested in a little disco retro. Yeah. yeah. I can remember. It was basically a spin-off of Saturday Night Fever. It was at Paramount. They had all the music. Uh, and so I was in the show, I was in the TV series, and went to the producers and said, hey, so what's happening with the song? Is there a song for the show and titles? And they said, yeah, well, we've probably got the four seasons going to record. So I said, well, I'm sure we'll have to have an opportunity to try. So they got me together with Fr uh, Freddie Perrin and Dino Fricaris were the writers of this song. They also had 
Peaches and Herb were two of their, you know, reunited, shake your groove thing, two big songs that they had recorded and were written and recorded. So I got a chance to meet with them in their studio and said, well, I'm in the show, and they go, well, let's hear it. So I remember singing, you know, getting the demo of the song, and so going in to record, to sing it with them. <coughs> and they had asked me, should I try one of these? Oh, then that if you want. So they, they said, you know, the guy said, so where are you from? I said, I'm from uh, Connecticut. He goes, well, it sounds a little Connecticut. Whatever that means. I don't know. And so I went to school in Philly. He goes, give me Philly. I want Philly. So, oh, we sharing this? Okay. <laughs> this is a good show. <laughs> and so away I went, and I was singing, I'm making it. And uh, we recorded it over a Thanksgiving weekend in 1978. And it was yeah. released. And uh, the song went to number five in the top 40. I had this, had this gold record. Uh, you know, so cool. On RSL label, which was Robert Stigwood, who happened to have this band called the Bee Gees, yeah. that they were battling over, you know, what bands battle, you know, labels over. Mm -hmm. So that, that sort of ended my record career when RSL said, well, we're just going to disband the label. And, and that was the end of that. But, but I had a lot of fun. I mean, I was on Rockin' New Year's Eve, I was in Dick Clark, I was on American Bandstand, uh, I was on all these different things. You know, uh, because of this, of this record. Um, but I'm constantly trained. I'm, I'm, I'm here to do theater. You know, but you just never know how your career is going to go or where it's going to take you. Take every opportunity. Which brought me to John Landis's office not too long after that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to meet John. Well, actually, I, John doesn't, he didn't know this, but I actually met him uh, when he was looking for guys for Animal House. And so he was seeing actors both coast, east and west coast. At the time, I was living in California, and, um, and uh, so I met him on, on Animal House, which he had forgotten. So he thought the first time we met was for American Werewolf, which he had written when he was very young. And we met in his office at Universal, which was sort of intimidating, of course. You're sitting in this guy's office, and he walks in, and he's a young guy, and very funny and just down to earth and we had a nice opportunity to chat and I told him I had been to England, I'd lived there, studied acting there, that I had ridden my bike, which was my big thing, was I had ridden my bike around around Ireland called the Ring of Kerry, which is a big circle. Uh, he goes, oh, well then you might be interested. Read the script, call me tomorrow. So I read it, called him the next day, and he goes, well, you want to be a werewolf? And it was really pretty much that simple in terms well, didn't of have to do an audition or anything for no him. screen test or anything of that nature. But what he needed was to cast these two parts, David, the part I played, and Jack, played by Griffin Dunn, and needed them to get over to Rick Baker's shop. Rick Baker, of course, being the, the award you know, winning. soon to be yeah. Academy Award winning makeup artist for this film, which was his first Academy Award. And uh, so he wanted us to get over to his shop right away, which I did the next day. Went over to Rick's, and he said, what are you playing? I said, I'm playing David, because I feel sorry for you. <laughs> well, because this was long before any kind of CGI, anything of Yeah, this can, before computers, you know, this, can you imagine anyone old enough to remember what it was like, you know, no phones, no cell phones. I mean, we were talking, I was talking to my friend the other day, remember when we had a pager? You know, we had pagers, and you go, oh, wow, I got a call, I got to get to a phone. It you know? encodes to each other just yeah. with the numbers. And that's how we used to do auditions in New York and, and, and L.A. Wherever you are, you get a page, but who call, you have a message. You want to call your agents and see what your audition is and take down the information uh, and get to a pay phone, you know. That's changed a little bit. So Rick uh, put us through these, put me through this, you know, pretty incredible makeup for, uh, prosthetics. The basic idea of, you know, having my arms done and my legs, which was, you know, a challenge, but I, you know, went along with it. I was, at the time, I mean, you know, you're just saying, oh, whatever it takes, I'll do whatever you need. He's okay, now we're gonna do your head in this quick drying cement. Are you claustrophobic? Um, well, I didn't think I was. <laughs> you find out pretty quickly when you can't breathe in this fast drying cement. And he goes, okay, now we need one with your mouth open in like a snarl and hold it. So I'm like, you know. <laughs> It's like even worse than 
fantastic. Yeah, it, it is. It's just the same, and it's that same material. It's an alginate, they call it, and it's quick drying cement. And we did, you know, that many times. Um, and so, you know, he said, well, I'll see you in London. So that was the end of the Rick Baker experience at the beginning of this. Then we went to London, and just to give you an idea of how quickly this all happened, I met Landis in like October of 1980, and then John and met with Rick Baker, we began the preliminary makeup. Then we went over to England to shoot the film in February of 81, finished it like late March, and Rick you know, was there with all of his assistants and did all our makeup, that transformation scene I'll tell you a little bit about. And then the film came out in August of 81, so literally from... That turnaround's unheard of anymore. Yeah, really fast. How long did your process take for the makeup? That was a 10 hour a day, five days, for that transformation scene, which you only see, you know, whatever it is, 90 seconds, seconds yeah. maybe two minutes, yeah. max. Uh, we shot the entire film and just had that scene to do. We said, we're saving the best for last. <laughs> we're saving the torture for last. Yeah, so, uh, that, and that was, as I said, five days of sitting in Rick's makeup chair. And the first thing he would do is take my hands away, you know, put these paws on, and then, you know, layering on this hair, yak hair, strand by strand, and then, you know, the, the face uh, appliance pieces. So it was a slow process, I mean, really slow. And then when we'd go out on, on the set, it wouldn't take long to shoot, and John Landis, very fast director, would say, okay, that's good, we got it. And Rick would be, wait, no, wait, wait. I mean, it took me four months to make this preliminary, you know, this beginning part stage of the makeup transformation. Can we shoot some more? And John would say, well, what else? Like, for example, the hand was the first thing we shot where I had, a, you know, a fake arm to look at to look exactly like my hand, and it would stretch. And then, you know, John would say, okay, we got it. Rick would say, well, can we shoot some more? And John would say, well, what else does it do? It just stretched. We got it. Next. And so on. So he, he and Rick would go back and forth over how much to shoot of these different scenes. He was but, very hands-on when it came to all that. Oh, yeah. He wanted tons of blood. You know, get more blood. You know, we, we'd have these two or five-gallon bottles of, of, you know, would-be makeup, uh, blood looking like stuff and we wanted, yeah, we wanted to pour it on. So that was that. Uh, that. I should tell you about the wolf scene, actually working in the cage with wolves where I wake up in the zoo. Um, I should, I'll back it up a little bit going, you know, we were shooting in the zoo for a couple of days. One of the scenes where I'm stealing the coat and I look up and I see all these people in the back. I go, why do we have extras in the background over there? They said, oh, those aren't extras. The zoo's open. So we would, you know, we obviously would stay past the time allotted for us just to be there. And then they'd open the zoo and we'd still be shooting. Uh, in the wolf cage was one of these, I'm, I'm doing this once. I said to John, what is it? He says, well, you're going to wake up over here and the wolves will be over here. And then you get up and you go out and go up and over out the back of this cage is how you escape. I went, oh, okay, well, let's do this once. So, I'm, you know, the first and only take, I kind of get up and I see the wolf and the wolf starts to walk toward me. You know, and I'm going, well, We're um, on that. no. And so you ask beforehand, what's the story on these wolves? And they go, well, they've been fed. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And, you know, that's the extent of their training. They've been fed and they said, no fast movements, you know, no loud noises. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be yelling, but I'm not going to be tiptoeing on anything. Yeah. So that was the experience. It's a little different nowadays. Yeah, and these wolves, I mean, you know, you see a wolf. First of all, they can jump. You know, I saw, I mean, they can jump 10 feet high. They can jump up, up and over. Uh, and they don't really give you any sort of inclination of what they're thinking. They just have these, you know, crazy yellow eyes. And they don't, your ears don't go back. Um, they don't, you know, snarl at all. They just look at you. And it's a very discomfort. And the wild animal. Especially, yeah, it's a wild animal. You're in there with these trainers, supposedly the train handlers. <laughs> Feeders. Yeah, they just, and it's good luck. You never want to hear that. <laughs> no, you don't. And, you, and as I said, we went out and over the, I did that one take, and I said, that's it. You know, 
I'm not going back in there. So John said we got it. Yeah, he, yeah. he was happy with that. Well, we are going to take questions from the audience if anybody has questions. If we can see the audience. I, yeah, we, we can, can bring really the house lights up. We can bring the house lights up. Maybe we can bring some lights it, up. I think we have a microphone out there. Is there a stand? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, if you want to line up right there at that microphone, if you have any questions, feel free to line up. If, uh, make sure you don't ask any yes or no questions because it doesn't get us anywhere. And if, try and think of something he maybe hasn't been asked a million times. I have to tell you one, I used to think, I wonder what the dumbest question I've ever been asked. So I'll share that with you. Uh, this guy gets up and goes, were you the actor or the wolf? I went, okay. I said, that's all the time we have. Yeah, that was, and it was in Australia, which was crazy, because I was thinking, would they fly me down here if I was just the wolf? In the yes. Yeah. Well, Nowadays, yeah. Maybe now they would. Anyway, looks what's like there's name? someone over there. Hi, what's your name? Hello. Whoa, sorry. My name is Derek. I'm actually with the podcast, Little Bragging of Wars, and we come to you guys this last season. Did someone clap? Yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you. But, um, obviously the transformation scene, legendary. Um, one of my favorite scenes though is at the end with the choreography with the car crashes. It looked like madness. Can you give us a little bit of a background on what it was like to shoot that? In, in Piccadilly Circus? With yeah. The crash? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that's one of those scenes that we, they, they, I could say we, but it was really, they stole. They didn't have permission to shoot that scene in Piccadilly because they wouldn't give them permission to just close that major, you know, it's five major roads that all converge on this big roundabout in Piccadilly. And so they decided that, well, they had to have it. So at the, you know, pre-dawn hours one night, uh, they had cameras mounted on buildings all around Piccadilly and stuntmen in every uh, street that converges on uh, in the circus at Piccadilly roundabout. And on action, they just all came screaming into the, into the Piccadilly and crashed and yelled cut and dispersed all in a period of about five like minutes. Guerrilla filming? Yeah, it was. It was literally, yeah, I remember going, you know, being there at 5.30 in the morning to see the scene because, first of all, the anticipation of what was going to happen and everyone was on the radio and they came in and crashed and then this cut, okay, wrap, and then just everyone was able to drive away. And it was as if, you know, nothing had happened. Um, and then there was another location where they had, they would do the inserts of, you know, cars crashing and doing close-ups. But uh, that initial master was, was basically a stolen scene without permission. And uh, it's in the film. A lot, of, just about everything we shot was in the film. Um, it, that's the screenplay that John wrote when he was 21 years old. And, you know, the, we were, Nobody really knew how it was going to look, certainly in the transformation scene, uh, what the wolf was going to look like. You know, the, one of the scariest moments that fans have told me about over the years is in the subway, and you just see it, you know, you just see it start to crawl, and the guy's going up the escalator looking at it, and you just see it sort of coming in. Um, so it's, <clears throat> like many horror films, I've always said, is the less you see of the creature, the better it is. And uh, they, they, you know, Pretty, uh, you know, very much wanted to do that with this film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. I love that it's a whole. It seems like it was a whole series of one takes. Yeah. It was just all meant. Generally, to be John, yeah, out. he would do that. And if there were any scenes together, you know, with another actor, he would sometimes tell one actor one thing and not the other, so you didn't know. And you know, not not everybody likes to work that way. You know, it's a collaboration. Is the whole idea is that everyone's on the same page and we're gonna try to accomplish something in a scene. Uh, he, he liked to have some real reactions. So with Jenny Agater, he would tell, say some things to her or you know, would say something to me to try on Jenny. And you know, no other actor really wants to be surprised by his fellow actor in a scene, but this was a you know, wild and crazy experience. Things were done you know, right then and there, uh, off the cuff almost. Yes. Hello. Thank you for doing this. First off, love the film. Saw when I was a kid. I think I'm one of the older people. No. You? Okay, good. No, you cannot. You're science fiction now. Wait. 
What's your name? Uh, Randy. Hi, you know me. I've, I've seen you a few times. Uh, okay, okay, watch me. The, I have the great Harry Hamlin question. I'm that guy. Then we'll answer the question. So. Okay, wait. Yeah, so anyway, with you, the question I have, I grew up, my brother, older brother, had the Playboy. And you became the celebrity, the naked celebrity. If you remember, Dr. Pepper really got angry. And I, okay, I hate to say this, if someone's sensitive, Playboy called you Dr. Pecker after <laughs> that. Did that affect your career in any way? Sit down, Randy. <laughs> No, uh, you know, there was always rumors about how doc, Dr. Pepper uh, and I parted company because of the fact that I was in the film. It, was, was, play, it was Playboy that said it. Just to be clear, I read yeah. the Playboy, so I don't know if it's true. Okay, you read the article. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, but, but the, the, re the truth of it was, after four years of being their spokesman, I, I was pretty much done and thinking that, you know, it was time for me to move on, which thinking back, I'm going, you know, probably could have gone another four or five years, you know, eight years of being the spokesman. But that was it, uh, four years of that for me. Um, and, you know, I, the, the naked scenes were, they're written in the script, but it doesn't appear as much as you see in the film. I mean, I've had people come up and go, you're naked in that movie over half the time. I mean, well, not really, but, you know, there are those scenes where I, I'm dreaming, dreaming sequences, and um, I'm, we you know. More. Yeah, you just well, notice them more. Yeah. Let me be clear, you looked amazing. I think Randy has a crush on you. I do, I do. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Randy Hamlet's next. I have to say my crush right here. I have my Lisa right away. <laughs> Call the police, I got him. But no, like I said, the Playboy thing, my brother got Playboy, I read it, and you were here, and I wanted to ask, because so many rumors and so many things were, Dr. Pepper parted ways with you. This happened because of this, and this happened because of right. that. And I wanted to clarify that it, I don't think it did. Yeah, uh, well, as I said, I, it was really my decision after four years to know, you know, to let the uh, advertising agency, the Yogi Rubicam, who were handling the Pepper account, that I was kind of done. I didn't want to do be the Pepper guy anymore. I think you moved on to something bigger and better. Yeah, sure. so oh, I, yeah, I mean, your career is fucking so Let's just be clear. But yeah, I wonder. All right. Well, thank you. That's a new yeah. one. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> I know um, there's been a lot of really great cosplays of people from the movie, and I know a friend of mine, Patty, actually played the balloon costume. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen cosplays of people from Rare Marvel? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had people dress and come up and, you know, uh, be in parkas and things and clawed faces. And, yeah, it's, uh, took a long time to do that. <laughs> yes, you have a question. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about your experience about the brutal massacre of musical? Uh, Beautiful Brutal Massacre, I don't know if people are familiar with this film. It's a, a small independent film that we did a few years back, uh, written and directed by a, a, a man named Steve Mena, who uh, wanted to incorporate things that happened to him on his very first film project. And he put these different scenes in this film, Brutal Massacre, which is basically the story of, I play uh, a director, Harry Pendarecki, who directs all these well-known horror films. And this one is one of the films that we're directing, that I'm directing at the time, it's called Brutal Massacre. And it's a terrible movie, but of course it becomes a very successful film in our film. Uh, and uh, it, 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 the scene, or the film opens at a Fangoria convention. So if you've been to these, as you all have sitting here, uh, that's one of the kind of fun things about that film is that it takes place at the Fangoria Convention and I'm one of the well-known directors at a panel talking about this film. Um, some of the scenes that we had that took place that actually happened to the director was he was shooting a scene and he needed a prop so he saw a guy on his set, gave him some money and the keys to one of the production vans and said, go into town and get me whatever it was he needed and come back. The guy took the money and the keys, jumped in the car and took off, only to find out the guy didn't work on the film. <laughs> so we put that in the, in the movie as well. Um, we, you know, we had a supposedly a special effects guy who, you know, is supposed to, you know, be a terrific effects man, who, you know, it turns out he, he brings a blow-up doll as one of the victims, you know, in, in our little film. And so, I mean, it's a comedy. Um, 
and it's, it, you know, I think it, it deserves to be looked at. There's some pretty interesting productions in it, uh, performances in it, I should say. Uh, Gunnar Hansen, the late, great Gunnar Hansen from uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he plays a guy like a Vietnam veteran who is <clears throat> gives permission to our company to shoot in a, in a like a haunted uh, mansion when he actually has no business giving us permission to shoot there. Uh, that happened to the director as well. So uh, if you get a chance and you get to see Brutal Massacre, uh, you know, I recommend you check it's it out. It's a deep dive. Yeah. Very cool. Last one. Sorry, back again. You're fine. Uh, another scene question about uh, American Werewolf in London, but uh, the scene where you're talking to Jack in the movie theater, and there's a very adult movie going on at the same time. Was that shot at the same time, or was that something that Landis brought in afterwards? I'm just curious. No, that, that sort of porn stuff uh, was the first day of shooting, and the crew almost all left uh, as a result. You know, crews don't generally read the scripts, they're not available to them. They just basically, you know, get hired on, the show, on shows to do a specific job for a specific period of weeks. So they didn't really know. They knew John Landis, certainly from his success with Animal House and the Blues Brothers. But they didn't know what this werewolf movie was really going to be about. They didn't have access to the script. So the first day of shooting, they cast these actors to do the porn film, which if you, you know, look, look at it and listen to it, it's ridiculous dialogue. <laughs> it's the best dialogue ever. It's so good. It's, yeah, it's really, you know, very ridiculous dialogue. So they, yes, but they were shooting that scene for day one. We were not... Yeah, as actors, we were still, we were like day three going, well, what are they shooting? They're shooting the porn stuff that's in the theater that's going to be playing later. So, and as I said, many of the crew were upset going, we got to get off this movie. You know, we're going to stay. This is just background music. So, uh, but that was, that was, the, yeah, that was what was going on. And they had auditions and the whole thing, Landis, uh, created that and wrote those scenes, and they're pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Thank Dan. you. At what point when the movie was out and, you know, people were going to see it and it was getting popular, at what point did you realize that you were part of something that is going to continue on as almost a legacy? Right? Well, I certainly didn't know, and I don't think any of us knew um, how it was going to be received. In fact, it was kind of, you know, open with mixed reviews, particularly because of the comedy involved. We were criticized for it being funny, when in fact, you know, it was a horror film. And the idea of horror and comedy in the same film. Dark was, comedy was yeah, weird. Yeah, it was difficult to review, and uh, a lot of people didn't know how to take it. But um, we knew, you know, once the Academy Awards came out and Rick Baker was nominated, then he became the winner of the very first one in that category for the film. And it was a slow, you know, a slow growing uh, appreciation. And over the years, certainly since and the CGI came along, uh, people had more of a respect for practical makeup, which is what this film is really, you know, set the bar pretty high. Yeah, which we all know from Universal, it's pneumatics that he introduced to yeah. the, the costumes. Yeah. Air pressure. And, and so it's really been a slow thing over the years, being one of those set the bar high for practical makeup. And uh, if you want to compare it with the CGI, you know, this film seems to stand you know, as an example of when you don't need CGI, you can see uh, a film with transformation. And, and done really well. Done pretty so darn well. Let's well, see, um, one more, and then we're going to wrap things up. Well, since you're sitting behind me, if I can, I've seen you before, but I didn't have the courage to go up and talk. <laughs> if I can ask a couple What's your names? Uh, Dawn. <laughs> Excuse me. Dawn. Um, one, do you ever go over to Universal and kind of participate at all in any of that? No, you know, I, I knew it was there. I mean, they, they had approached me, you know, 35 years ago or so, you know, to do, to pick, to get the rights to the show that they show, I guess, whatever they show. I, but I know it's there, and I know it's still playing, showing Rick Baker's makeup and, um, and showing... They you know, blow their minds, just show up one day. I can get you in. <laughs> That's it, I'm going to have to know somebody in a red dress. <laughs> Only there is somebody in this entire hotel who can get you in a Universal. Yeah. They do have two models of your head, and it shows Yes, they do, and I want them back. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I wonder, do you keep in touch at all with any of the remaining cast? 
Well, Griffin and I have done a couple of shows. Uh, we have a show coming up uh, in Pennsylvania called Monster Mania, which is one of those one of three shows. Uh, that's in two weeks where Griffin and I will be at the same show. Jenny Agander is uh, in England. She, you know, and she's, she's been appearing in the show um, The Midwife. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen it. Midwife. Yeah, called yeah. Midwife. Where she's she like a mother superior going, Jenny, I knew you your wet. <laughs> you know, but now here she is, yeah, playing a nun. Going, okay, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen, seen her. Uh, John Woodvine is still alive. And, you know, played Dr. Hirsch. I saw him, he was like an Avengers or something, and I looked in the, in the opening scene where they're panning across what looked like all these uh, elderly cardinals, and there, 93 years old, is John Woodvine working in a movie going, God bless you, John. Would you like your career to continue? I don't know about being, you know, as a cardinal at age 93, you know. <laughs> But uh, I've enjoyed these. These are fun because, as I say, you get an opportunity to meet people that, um, as, and I never anticipated, you were saying that we have, you know, any inkling that the, sh the yeah. movie would be successful or continue to, you know, find an audience. Uh, what, what has struck me are people that went into makeup or got involved, were inspired by Rick Baker's work to want to continue to be in special effects and actors who, you know, that I've met who saw this film, or just their introduction to horror as a genre, said, that was the first movie I ever saw. My dad showed me when I was eight. Eight? <laughs> you know, this, Very special family. Yeah, but I, I know, you know, I mean, how many of you were too young to see this movie the first time you saw yeah. it? Like, to see that? I think pretty much anybody. Everybody, you know. Yeah. But that was back then, you know, they had this rating system, and you know, couldn't get in. Yeah. Well, so. I think also the people who saw that film, you know, as teens or whatever, turned into parents who showed their kids, and now we've got the generation. Yes, called. the next generation. And in fact, I would just close by saying people have asked, you know, what about the thought of a remake, which was oh. been kicked around the last couple of years, of being redone, a new American World from London, which I said, you know, why? Why, why would you do that? Uh, but my feeling is, if, you, if it is done, that'll be fine, because you know what will happen? People will say, yeah, but did you see the original? Yeah, yeah. And so we'll find a new audience. <laughs> we'll see. But please come by, you know, where the celebrity room is, and people are getting autographs, and I hope a lot of you will come by and say hello. It's going to be a fun weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.